So let's get right into it. Uh, this has a number of different competing interactions. Uh, and there are many 3D telluride, all insulators, and uh, you can put just about all the 3D elements in there. And I always like to pretend the uh, structures are cubic, but it really isn't as strongly distorted. And has a large unit cell. Uh, for example, the cobalt oxygen uh, bonds can vary by 50% in length, so you can have a, a quite different uh, competing interactions. Uh, the cobalt system orders uh, at 26 Kelvin and then undergoes a number of different uh, additional magnetic and ferroelectric uh, phase conditions, and we'll go through those. Uh, early measurements were done on powders, and it turned out you really couldn't solve uh, the magnetic structures using just powder. And uh, we got involved with uh, single crystal neutron measurements, uh, both in zero field and in magnetic field and electric fields, and uh, some X-ray uh, powder. So uh, this is a fairly uh, young material, as materials go. I don't know if it's in the uh, molecular uh, foundry database, but uh, it looks uh, pretty simple. Here's a tellurium atom. Here, here are these uh, kind of distorted uh, uh, octahedra of uh, cobalt uh, surrounded by oxygen. I'll show you that uh, that's uh, separately simple. Uh, a number of other groups uh, have uh, worked on these materials, uh, doing powder diffraction and, uh, and some uh, second harmonic generation and measurements like that. Uh, we got involved uh, with Wen Shen Li, a former uh, postdoc of mine, now in Taiwan. And uh, we have a couple of papers and then one uh, recent one that uh, is under consideration. Uh, theory was uh, is being done and was done by Brooks Harris uh, in uh, Innsbruck, Innsbruck land out there. So here is perhaps, uh, perhaps a little bit better view of the crystal structure. Uh, it's uh, monoclinic, and you have these kind of highly distorted uh, honeycomb cobalt, uh, tellurium, and cobalt oxygen planes. And so these go along here. And then you have these zigzag chains going along uh, this direction. And they really uh, develop magnetic order separately. There's some interaction between those, and uh, so we'll go through those. So the, so the first example was uh, done by her and collaborators, and they found a number of different phase transitions. These are uh, DC susceptibility measurements done as a function of various magnetic fields, and they found a ordering at about 26 Kelvin and another phase transition down here uh, that splits under a magnetic field, and they really didn't understand uh, what was going on on these materials. And uh, so that's when we got involved uh, with the Wen Shen Li. If you look at the specific heat, here's the specific heat as a function of uh, various magnetic fields, and you see you have a nice phase transition around uh, 15 Kelvin here, that's quite uh, field dependent. And then there's this uh, magnetic ordering temperature that's also quite field dependent, up to 14 Tesla here. And, uh, so we started looking at a single crystal of this, and sure enough, we found here at the 22 Kelvin, which is just below the 26 Kelvin, you see uh, there's a peak in the center, which is a structural peak, and then four incommensurate satellites uh, surrounding that. And you can, uh, of course, you can see that at many different uh, reciprocal lattice vectors on this uh, map of the scattering. When you go down from 22 to 16 Kelvin, which is above this where we thought the uh, uh, transition at 15 Kelvin should occur, uh, we got a little bit different pattern. We saw that the on top of this uh, particular structural peak, for example, there's an extra magnetic signal. So there's commensurate magnetic order that has developed. And then these two peaks now have collapsed along the k-direction into one single peak. So that was a, a bit of a surprise. And then when you cool down a little bit lower, you get another surprise that these peaks, the incommensurate peaks, pop back out again. And, uh, and so in the ground state, you have 
four uh, incommensurate peaks in this scattering plane, the HK scattering plane, uh, in addition to commensurate magnetic orbs. So you have two different kinds of magnetic orbs. So we'd like to sort out where all this magnetic order is coming from. And so uh, if you look more carefully, uh, this is at uh, 22 uh, Kelvin, and you see uh, a peak in the center here, which is purely structural. I'll show you the polarized beam uh, results to uh, indicate that. And then you have this four peaks around here. There's also quite a bit of critical scattering, or inelastic scattering, around these incommensurate uh, satellites. 16.5 Kelvin, you see that these two have collapsed into a single peak. Uh, there's extra magnetic scattering here, so you have three magnetic peaks. And then at ground state, you see these four peaks surrounding this structural plus magnetic peak. So if you look uh, a little bit more carefully uh, at the uh, scattering, for the commensurate magnetic order, you don't see any commensurate magnetic order until you get down to around 19 and a half Kelvin. You see some magnetic scattering starting to develop here. You have a very strongly first order transition at 18 Kelvin, and, uh, and then nothing happens to the commensurate order, and then a new component of the magnetic order comes in at commensurate. So this is described as a gamma 4 transition, uh, and then there's a, a new irreducible representation that comes in here uh, around 15 Kelvin, which is gamma 3. If you look at the incommensurate wave vectors, they're uh, strongly temperature dependent. So this is the H component, and you see that it uh, you know, changes a little bit as a function of temperature, and then you have this first order drop where the peak just collapses in the K direction and then pops back up uh, at this uh, 15 Kelvin uh, transition. So at the First ordering here at 26 Kelvin, you have this incommensurate peak that comes up. There's no commensurate order, so it's purely incommensurate. And, and then the commensurate order comes in here down at the lower temperatures here. And you can see that the, both the intensity and the wave vectors of the incommensurate order are strongly temperature dependent as you go through these different transitions. So you can see the commensurate order a little bit better on this graph, for example, here. You see a little bump here, and that's just that critical scattering I was talking about. And then you see this uh, uh, first, these gamma 4 magnetic order that comes in, and then it becomes ferroelectric in this region, and I'll show you that in a little bit, uh, exactly what that ferroelectricity looks like. And then you have an additional component, the gamma 3 component, that comes in here. And uh, the system is ferroelectric all the way down to low temperatures, but with a very small ferroelectric moment. One other surprise that we got uh, fairly recently is that if you look at the uh, H component of the incommensurability, uh, 19 Kelvin, it just has a single peak, and this is more or less resolution limited. But as you go through this, transition at around 18, 18 and a half Kelvin, you see the, the width starts to grow in size and actually the peak splits and you get two incommensurate uh, uh, peaks along the H direction until you get to the ferroelectric transition and then uh, they just collapse back into a single peak. Okay. So here are the incommensurate wave vectors and We've also done the L component, so the incommensurability is uh, along all three directions, uh, X, Y, and Z. Uh, so here's this uh, splitting of this H component. We do not see a splitting in, in either of the other components of the incommensurate wave vector. Uh, and then you get this uh, drop down and jump up uh, in the H value and drop down to zero a value, and L just kind of lopes along, uh, like uh, doesn't really care about any of these transitions. Okay. So we've combined our single crystal results, where we know exactly what all these wave vectors are, with a powder diffraction to get a complete refinement uh, as best we can. Uh, there's still a few ambiguities, but the bottom line is the following. 
is that there are really two types of magnetic order. And on these zigzag chains, that's where the incommensurate magnetic order develops. And it's a non-collinear magnetic structure, as you can see along here. And it's incommensurate in all three directions. So that's one part. And then there's the commensurate part. Uh, and here's the, in principle, there are three different cobalt crystallographic sites, but they all have, as far as we can tell, very similar moments. So we just set all the three moments uh, to be, and it's just a simple collinear uh, antiferromagnetic structure. So at least we have some simplicity. Now the question is, how does this relate to the ferroelectricity uh, and, uh, and ma uh, magnetic order, and how do these peaks behave as a function of electric and magnetic fields? So here's the magnetic field. Uh, here are, uh, this is in the ground state at 1.5 Kelvin. You have these four incommensurate peaks and a commensurate peak here. Uh, you apply a 14 Tesla field, and you can see that these peaks shift. In fact, the, these two have shifted uh, out of the, out of the uh, window of the position sensor detector at this particular uh, setting. Uh, if you look at the uh, incommensurate peaks as a function of magnetic field. There is a first order transition around 10 Tesla. There's also one uh, up uh, around 30 Tesla that was uh, seen with the bulk magnetization. And so there's a, a spin, uh, spin transition in the incommensurability in a magnetic field. Uh, what about uh, electric fields in the, uh, in the ferroelectricity? Uh, these are data by uh, Singh and collaborators, and uh, this is the pyroelectric current, so you see the uh, current coming in here, and you have a beautiful uh, order parameter uh, for the ferroelectricity. However, uh, if you look closely at the inset here, this is with a, a, an implied magnetic field of 5 tesla and 3 tesla. Zero field, you have a very, very tiny uh, electricity. It's uh, basically microcoulombs per meter squared. Uh, so it's uh, you know, barely uh, observable. So that's one of the interesting things in this material is the magnetic field, the ferroelectricity is very sensitive to an applied magnetic field. Uh, one of the other things that we did with neutrons is look at the lattice parameters versus temperature and the lattice constants versus temperature. <coughs> you see a rather large anomaly in this ferroelectric regime, which comes in around 18 Kelvin. Now, the, the other uh, interesting thing is you look at the commensurate magnetic order, and so uh, it's susceptible to an applied electric field. So uh, here is the, the electric field. Uh, at 21 Kelvin, you don't see any effect when you go the 18 Kelvin, which is right at the phase boundary, you don't see any effect. 15 Kelvin, where it starts to become uh, ferroelectric, you see the electric field enhances the magnetic scattering. This is the additional magnetic scattering that you see at the commensurate magnetic field. And, uh, and that just grows as you go down the lower temperature. So the ferroelectricity is sensitive to electric fields and adds magnetic scattering in when you apply the electric field, or the commensurate order. If you look at the incommensurate order, there's no effect of the electric field. So it seems like these uh, distorted honeycombs are the ones that carry the ferroelectricity and are sensitive to uh, electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, incommensurate peaks really don't seem to be uh, participating in the ferroelectricity. And then the final part of this is uh, uh, when we went down the low temperatures, you see this is, uh, this is the O2O, and there's no magnetic peak here. When you start to get the commensurate magnetic order, in addition to the two satellites in this scattering plane, which is, uh, you see the magnetic order in these two peaks. And when you go into the ground state, uh, you also see second order peaks coming in. Now, that's very unusual. So uh, typically, if you have something like a spin density wave, 
you only have odd order peaks or a pure spiral you have uh, so you get the primary peak and then third order that's a time reversal symmetry argument that, uh, that uh, if you have no net magnetization in the system then you have only odd order peaks you see an even order peak here typically what it is is a structural distortion that follows the magnetic distortion that's what happened for example in chromium uh, so we wanted to see we expected that that was a structural distortion, but we did the polarized beam, and we got a surprise that, no, uh, both of those peaks are magnetic. And so what that really means is that the symmetry has been broken, and there's a net magnetization that develops in the system. That's actually been uh, seen, uh, and uh, these are the polarized beam results showing this uh, uh, second order peak coming in it's kind of an order parameter uh, below about the 13 Kelvin or so, and it's magnetic. Uh, Toledano and their collaborators are using second harmonic generation have looked at the domains in this and find that the ferroelectric and ferromagnetic domains are coupled together. And uh, so that was uh, one indication, uh, and that certainly preceded uh, our results. And Singh and all also reported some short-range ferromagnetic order is what they, what they think. But this is really long-range, both of, with, with our results and, and with the domain structures here. So it seems like there's a net magnetization that develops at low temperatures uh, that you can couple in uh, with the ferroelectricity. Okay. And then the final thing that I wanted to mention was a uh, Taiwan group has carried out some uh, synchrotron X-ray uh, measurements uh, to try to look for a change in the charge distribution in this system. And they find, uh, so what this is, is a deficit of charge in red and an additional of charge in blue here, or green, turquoise, and you can see, for example, on this tellurium Q site uh, that you get a fair amount of charge that separates off into the, the oxygen. Uh, you get some charge shift here. And if you just kind of put arrows on each of these kind of dipoles, you see that you have a number of different dipoles in different directions that add up almost to zero. And in fact, it's really uh, for these charge density distributions, uh, taking the charge density at 6 Kelvin and subtracting from 18 Kelvin, uh, that that's within the error that you get a very small ferroelectric moment. So then the bottom line is it looks like this is really mostly an anti-ferroelectric. And then if you apply a magnetic field, you can induce uh, a lot more ferroelectricity. So the basic phase diagram here is you go from a, a paramagnetic, paraelectric phase uh, into an incommensurately ordered phase where the zigzag chains order magnetically. <coughs> and no magnetization in the system, no uh, ferroelectricity. Uh, you go in below 19 and a half and you get this gamma 4 commensurate magnetic order developed in here along with a, uh, the same type of incommensurability, a little bit different, no ferroelectricity. 18 Kelvin is when the ferroelectricity comes in. You get this gamma 3 uh, irreducible representation coming in with a change in the incommensurate uh, state and uh, ferroelectric components. Very tiny uh, but easily uh, made into a sizable ferroelectric. So the summary is that we have incommensurate magnetic order, and that's the way the system initially orders on the zigzag chains. We have a commensurate magnetic order that develops uh, around 19 and a half Kelvin. Uh, you get changes in the incommensurate and commensurate magnetic orders. You get uh, ferroelectric or anti-ferroelectric order developing uh, below 18 Kelvin. Uh, in the uh, gamma 3 representation that breaks the symmetry. Uh, ferroelectric is strongly affected by a magnetic field. 
uh, the commensurate magnetic order is affected by an electric field. The incommensurate order is not affected uh, by the uh, electric field. And then uh, net magnetization develops at or below the ferroelectric order. So uh, I mentioned those again. And then, oops, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, William and I have uh, two uh, relatively recent uh, reviews, one that just came out in this uh, quantum materials uh, journal that uh, same book as uh, editor on. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, time to take a while to questions. Uh, we're running off time. Uh, questions? You mentioned short range magnetic order. Yeah. Uh, how far is it above PC? Oh, uh